So it turns out, you know, if you prepare uh, a state which has large energy spread, it will evolve very fast into a distinguishable state. And they really nail down the notion of distinguishability and ask, you know, distinguishability of states, not only just of, of, of observables. Uh, this result, uh, which I think is very cute, you, you can read about it in Messiah book on, 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 on quantum mechanics, you know, many textbooks on quantum mechanics cover it, was rediscovered uh, a number of times and also generalized. Yeah? So Fleming provided a very cute derivation, very nice. Uh, of course, there are the uh, crucial works of Anandana and Haronov, geometrizing quantum dynamics. Uh, Ullman made, uh, I would say, very remarkable uh, contributions, which we will discuss, generalizing this to mixed states and to time-dependent states. And well, essentially, you know, there was progress over a few decades, but it was really uh, near the 2000s when our Norm Margolus and Le Levitin introduced an alternative bound, which saw that the same time scale for something to happen, that this orthogonalization time, the time for a state to become more, to, for a state of a system to evolve into an orthogonal state, is lower bounded by the mean energy of the system, the mean energy above the ground state. Yeah. So, well, you know, th this result was actually um, put forward and discussed in the context of quantum computation. And uh, it was uh, used to make the point that uh, any, any logic, any process in nature has a minimum time scale. And if you want to compute faster, say, with a a quantum computer, then you will need a large uh, energy of your system to be able to perform logical operations quickly. So in a way, this marvelous levitin bound was used to discuss limits on the computational capability of physical devices. This is uh, in particular, apart from uh, marvelous and levitin work uh, emphasized by Lloyd and others. Well, th there were a series of advances, uh, you know, in, uh, in particular generalizations to non-Hermitian uh, quantum systems. Uh, tight bounds, uh, when these bounds are reached. And I guess my take on this uh, was in 2013, we saw that these bounds are not only restricted to isolated systems, they can as well be generalized to open quantum systems. So that was, was a first contribution I did. Then uh, we also use them to characterize the coherence time scales, generalizing seminar results by Surek, but for arbitrary uh, Markovian evolution. And uh, finally, <laughs> with Norma Volus, uh, Aurelia Chenu, and Brendan Sanahan, we realized actually that speed limits are not just quantum. You know, they, they have classical counterparts, which are as natural. So maybe I say even a bit about that. Okay. Uh, sorry, Adolfo, a yes. quick uh, question here. So I was just wondering about your comment on quantum computation and speed limits, but these speed limits that you introduce, these are naturally evolving states just under quantum evolution, right? In quantum computation, you can use some kind of gates to basically change the state of the system as well. So we are not talking about that here. Well, but you will say that, you know, maybe this gate is generated by some underlying Hamiltonian. So there will be a minimum time scale for to I implement see. this gate. Uh, you know, I guess this is part of the reasoning uh, behind. Yeah. Um, okay. Then you can say, you know, even the, if the dynamics is non-unitary or you make a measurement, how this bounds should be modified. But essentially they capture the idea that uh, energy provides a limited resource for the implementation of logical operations. I see. Some people have challenged that statement and I will mention them. Okay, uh, let me just provide you a, a, a very simple um, intuition of how these bounds are derived. Uh, essentially one line. So the, the work by Mandelstam and Tan started from the Heisenberg equation of motion for an operator A evolving under a time independent Hamiltonian H. And they define, you know, essentially what is the characteristic time scale associated with the mean value of the observable. So they look at the rate of change of the mean value of the observable and say whenever it changes by a magnitude of the order of its dispersion, yeah, then I, I, I say that this is the characteristic time scale in which the observable changes. Well, combining this definition with the Heisenberg equation of motion, just using Cauchy's bus inequality, you arrive to famous time energy uncertainty relation. And in their work, they, they went one step beyond. They say, well, let A be the projector on the initial state. And then you are looking at how the time dependent state differs from the initial state. And this is really the notion of quantum speed limits. So their work was pretty uh, way ahead, I would say. 
Now, the uh, other result by uh, Norman Wolfsammer and Lev Levitin uh, proceed a bit differently. They consider an uh, arbitrary quantum state evolving uh, under some time independent Hamiltonian. Uh, so typically, uh, you can write it down as a coherent superposition. And they look again to this survival amplitude. You know, what's the, prob the, the probability amplitude that the state at time t uh, remains in the initial state? Yeah. And then they look at this quantity and say, well, what's the when, when could this quantity vanish? Yeah. So when, when a t can be zero. So they look at the real part and they make use of some trigonometric inequality. And in that way, they essentially realize that uh, the minimum time for, for the, this uh, probability amplitude to vanish is actually lower bounded by the uh, mean energy. Uh, these two results are very quantum, yeah, you may say, yeah, because they start with the Heisenberg equations of motion and they use the notion of uh, 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 coherent superpositions over energy eigenstates and orthogonality of, of, of quantum states. Uh, I want to quickly present uh, a very different take, which is very classical, it's exclusively classical. Uh, we are working on the quantum counterpart, but let me just now consider a classical system in which the state of the system is actually a stochastic variable. So you, you are describing the evolution according to some probability distribution for the state of the system to be found in a given state, lowercase x, at time t. And we define what is called the surprisal, which is the minus the logarithm of this probability. Well, uh, the if you look at the rate of this quantity of the surprisal, which essentially tells you how much information you acquire by measuring the state of the system in, in a given configuration X, uh, the mean value of the, of the rate of the surprisal vanishes. And this is just essentially a statement about conservation of probability. Yeah? Uh, well, with this input, it's not difficult to show uh, that a very general equation in the spirit of Mandel's tam-tam holds for classical systems. And if you look at the rate of change of uh, this almost resembles the Heisenberg equation of motion if you, uh, for mean values. If you look at the rate of change of uh, the mean value of an observable, then you can find that uh, instead of having kind of the commutator of the observable with h, you have the linear uh, correlations, the covariance between your observable and the surprisal rate. And then, as in the equation, uh, Heisenberg equation of motion, you have also a term that goes with the, you know, if the observable is time dependent, there will be an extra, uh, an extra term. So the, here we identify this, this crucial quantity, yes, which essentially is just defined in this way. Remember that uh, this term vanishes. So actually this is just, uh, if you wish, the, the, uh, the uh, mean value of A times I dot, uh, which is the surprise, the observable and the surprise uh, rate. Well, we can then uh, uh, proceed somewhat similarly to, to Mandel's time -tan and say that the, the typical time scale uh, for, for uh, associated with this evolution is going to be uh, given uh, in this form in terms of, of this, uh, the rate of change of these uh, linear correlations uh, over the dispersion of the observable. And again, using Cochier's bars uh, over the covariance, then you find that this is upper bounded by the uh, dispersion of the surprise rate. So the fluctuations in the surprise rate provide here essentially the maximum uh, 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 speed of evolution. Uh, Adolfo, sorry, one second. We have a question from Dominic, please go ahead. You can unmute yourself and ask the question. Uh, hi, Adolfo. Um, Hello. Hi, Dominic. I wonder what X is uh, because is it position or no, because no. this is classical, so just think of um, you know, a, a classical stochastic system where the system can adopt a uh, manifold of configurations. So these are labeled by X. So it's not the position, it's, you know, could, could be in maybe in some case, but just think of a, a discrete, uh, you know, a system with discrete configurations, discrete states, maybe like a staircase. And then you, you are just saying, you know, there's like a, a stochastic processes that, that allow me to jump from a state to a state. And you are wondering, you know, about minimum time scales regarding this evolution. 
So what can it be, for example, can it be, uh, let's say, energy level or something? It could be else? energy levels, in a, you know, or, you know, sites in a chromophore or, you know, like uh, uh, different, conf yeah. So, so not necessarily using face space for this, right? No, not, just... not necessarily face, but I think that to associate with it energy levels is, is interesting, but, you know, it's not li limited to that. It's, you know, yeah, any, any I would say it's anything that allows you to, cla to, to, this, to classify states of a system. And this could be in the language of phase space, in the language of energy levels, in you know, in, in position. It could be in, you know, uh, you know, some some mm -hmm. other pixelation of some uh, space of the system, some some even some other kind of configuration space. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh -huh. Sorry, Adolfo. One more, uh, just a continuation of Dominic's question. So. Uh, can we understand this x as some form of a continuous variable? The reason why I ask this because uh, then is your surprisal that you define here, uh, won't it be dependent on the coordinate system because of this logarithm that is sitting there? Yeah, uh, sure, sure. So the probability is, you know, so, so, so it could be discrete, you know, or, or it can be in principle continuous as well. I don't think that anything uh, breaks down. Uh, we formulated in a discrete case, but yeah. Uh, please, you have realized that, you know, the, the expectation value of the survival is what you will call the Shannon entropy. Yeah? So mm -hmm. uh, in, in a way, you know, it's something familiar. And uh, uh, sorry, you say that where well, it can be continuous. No, uh, yes, I, I, mean, I, I, I... I'm worried more about the variable X because if it is some form of a continuous variable like position, and then when you make a transformation of coordinates going from one coordinate system to another, because of this logarithmic factor, you'll get a Jacobian there, and then you'll just get addition of two logarithms. Uh, so you'll huh. not get the surprisal rate to be independent of the coordinate system. Uh, yeah, and it is case. not. It is not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, it because, is not. Because you, I you see. See, really the amount of information that you acquire when you make a measurement of the state of the system in the state X. So it's really uh, conditional on, on the state that you, uh, on the label X, yes. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I guess this, this language is very natural in the context of the stochastic thermodynamics, where you assume that the system has a, a number of discrete energy levels, which typically are energy, energy states, but they don't have to be. I just put this slide to cover the result that I was initially supposed to talk about, but also to make the point that speed limits need not to, to be quantum. So, they, they, you know, this, this, in this language, you can really make the translation to, to between quantum and classical. But I, I'm going to mainly focus on the uh, quantum version of the speed limits. Yes, I just wanted to kind of be uh, comprehensive in the presentation. Okay, so yes, also as a bit of quick motivation, you know, I guess uh, you, you understand that this is something very fundamental in quantum dynamics or classical dynamics, so it will have many applications. So let me just mention a few where this has been discussed. And I already mentioned quantum computation, and this was the early ideas by uh, Margulus Levitin, Serloy, and others saying that the minimum time for something to happen will limit the computational capability of a physical device. And then either the mean energy or energy variance, or perhaps some other moments of energy will uh, provide the minimum time scales and therefore bound the, the, the computational power. Also, you can realize that if instead of computing, you are interested in maybe uh, erasing information or something like this, you will have uh, also some kind of speed limits there, but maybe these are associated with open quantum processes. At any rate, there were a couple of works which more or less challenged this, this, this view that uh, energy provides a limitation on, on computational capability. Uh, I guess I haven't seen a, a, a follow-up discussion. Uh, I, um, you know, it looks to me that perhaps these works are not introducing the notion of bandwidth of, of the generator of the dynamics. I, um, yeah, I, I still need to understand them better, but I, I don't, yeah, okay. I just want to make the point that some people have objected to, to the general philosophy of speed limits bounding computational power. Uh, a different context where quantum speed limits have been shown to be very relevant is that of quantum metrology. In quantum metrology, where you are playing with one of the old atomic clocks or a modern one, you are interested in estimating a parameter of a system with a small error. So this could be a temperature or it could be frequency of a given interatomic transition. And this is precisely what is done in the context of atomic clocks. Yes. Now there's a framework uh, that is, uh, you know, developed to uh, formalize in quantum information theory uh, what's the uh, errors in parameter estimation, and you can uh, lower bound them in terms of uh, the square root of the quantum Fisher information, 
uh, which is a quantity defined in terms of the logarithmic uh, derivative of, of uh, so you know the, the, you write the, the evolution of your state with respect to the, the parameter you are changing in in this form and then this this object is the one which uh, you know th through this expression uh, constrains the errors in parameter estimation well okay fine this formalism is there is is used regularly and uh, I guess the point I want to make is that if you look at a specific relevant system and here I put a relatively uh, general master equation where I have a parameter x1 which is kind of the strength or, or it couples to the Hamiltonian directly so something related to the norm uh, or x2 which is something related to bath operators so this is a typical master equation where I have uh, unitary dynamics so this is kind of the will von Neumann part and this is dissipative part I'm taking a particular case of Markovian dynamics with uh, essentially is purely facing because I'm taking Hermitian Liblad operators uh, the point I want to make is that you can associate with uh, through quantum speed limits characteristic time scales associated with the uh, unitary evolution and associated with the dissipator. So this is really Mandel's tam tam kind of uh, uh, characteristic time scale, and this is uh, the the coherence time that follows very much in this in the same spirit. Well, when you use the formalism of quantum metrology and compute the quantum fissure information for this system, you see that actually it is this time scales, so the, the one of inverse of energy fluctuations or inverse of the variance of the limit operators that control the, your capability to estimate uh, the parameter uh, of the Hamiltonian and the parameter of the bath with uh, low errors. Yes, so it's really tau d and tau z that enter these equations. So you see there. Uh, that how quantum speed limits show up in the context of quantum metrology. So that was a kind of very specific example. Yet a different context in which quantum speed limits play a big role is uh, quantum thermodynamics. And I, I guess this is uh, a series of works uh, uh, so that uh, the output power of a heat engine is also uh, limited by quantum speed limits. Yes? So if you have a thermodynamic cycle, and you run it in finite time, uh, you can use quantum speed limits to show that the power cannot be larger than a given amount. Yeah? So in a way, you see the usefulness of quantum speed limits in this context and kind of uh, a, a reverse process. So the charging, or actually also on charging of power uh, in quantum batteries has been discussed in a series of works where you are, again see that quantum speed limits limit the ability to store energy in a physical device or actually to remove it from there. So yeah, yes, maybe some thermodynamic processes of interest uh, where you, you see the relevance of quantum speed limits. But you know, as fundamental results in quantum dynamics is pretty much limited by your imagination, uh, the scenario where uh, you, know, you may be able to uh, use quantum speed limits uh, to make a prediction about the limits of, of, the, of the process you want to describe. Good. So now I, I want to move a bit more to the core of the talk, which is how to actually measure them. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I have tried to be thorough with the literature. I, I'm unaware of any experiment which precisely probe quantum speed limits. Yes. And maybe maybe one, one can appreciate why this is challenging. So uh, I, I'm, I'm going to refine uh, the, 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 the ingredients required to do that. And the first is we need some notion of proximity between quantum states, yes. And in quantum information, we know that this, a good measure is provided by uh, the Ullmann fidelity. So if we have a state, a, a mixed state, and we study its time evolution, uh, we can use the Ullmann fidelity defined in this way to uh, see how close these two states are. Uh, Ullmann fidelity is not a, a, a distance, but you know we can use it to, to introduce a distance. And it still has, uh, you know, lots of nice properties. Now it turns out that for for computation, typically, you know, because of the definition involving square roots, it's typically difficult to get uh, precise results. Uh, you know, to, to, for a minimal system, uh, its computation is typically challenging. It is infinitely easier if one of the states is pure, because then the Ullmann fidelity is just the density matrix sandwiched by the ket and bra of the pure state. Yeah. So you know, this this is a usual case when one of the states is pure. And it's even you know, more familiar perhaps to elementary quantum mechanics whenever both states are pure than the, the Ullmann fidelity is just the overlap between the states. So it's just the probability for the state at time t to be found in the initial state, which is really the uh, very na naive intuition of, of I started with of, for the pendulum of the clock. Yeah. 
Good. So this is something we, we, we will need to uh, somehow be able to measure. And uh, I say that you know this is not properly a, a distance. However, the if you just take the r cosine of the square root of the fidelity, this is a quantity known as the Bure's angle or the Bure's length. It's essentially you know carries the same information. Yes, this happens to be a distance from the point of view that you know it vanishes if the two states are equal. Is symmetric on the arguments uh, fulfills the triangle inequality. So it has all the nice properties. Now, quantum speed limits, in particular, the kind of speed limit of the Mandelstam tam uh, type, can be reformulated as an upper bound for the Bure's angle in terms of some quantity. Uh, this is square, in particular, uh, this integral. Uh, so, so essentially, the distance traveled in, by the quantum state during an evolution for time tau is upper bounded by uh, the integral of the square root of the quantum feature information. And let me just say that for pure states, uh, also, excuse me, for unitary dynamics, the quantum feature information is just proportional to the energy fluctuations. So what we are saying is, you know, the, you know, we'll have an evolution and you, the state will evolve uh, Hilbert space and there will be a minimum, a distance cover swept. But this distance cannot be larger than the integral of the energy dispersion. Yeah? So this is a restatement of Mandelstam uh, time energy uncertainty relation as a quantum speed limit. So you see, if you want to test this inequality, you will have to measure energy fluctuations if you have unitary dynamics, and you will have to prove fidelities to be able to extract the Buddhist, the Buddhist angle. And uh, that's typically difficult. Uh, so I'm just going to focus on this result. So you know, so I guess uh, you can uh, essentially state that the uh, you know uh, um, the uh, quantum speed limit we are going to prove is that of Mandelstam tam uh, for time dependent uh, Hamiltonians. It turns out that Margulus levitin bound has n even uh, after 20 years uh, it has not been generalized. To time dependent Hamiltonians. The only bound that we know how to rigorously establish when the system is driven is that of Mandelstam time. And here you see, you see the minimum time scale for something to happen is essentially uh, lower bounded by the ratio of the Bure's angle over the uh, time average energy dispersion. Okay, so, so this is what, what we would like to measure in the, in the lab, these two quantities or the other ratio. Uh, so let's see how we can, how we can do it. And here is the connection with trap ultra cold gases. Yes, and I guess this is what was maybe uh, a bit unexpected because you know typically uh, when you, you you try to formalize a notion, you know, like quantum speed limits, maybe you you think of of qubits or you know a small uh, quantum system. And what we are going to do is to do exactly the opposite. You know, we are going to go for matter waves of many particles in arbitrary spatial dimension one, two, three, and uh, uh, Possibly with interactions, and uh, you know these are uh, continuous variable systems. So in a way, uh, uh, it's 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 relatively a challenging setting. However, we will see that under some conditions, these quantities, uh, Bure's angle and energy fluctuations, are readily available with current technology. So what I want to focus this proposal is not universal. I cannot uh, see how to extract the required quantities to measure speed limits in general. But in a class of dynamics, which is very relevant to colatoms, uh, we will be able to do it. And that's a scale invariant dynamics. And you know, just to get the intuition, it means that if I take a picture of uh, the cloud of the system, it doesn't have to be a Gaussian, it could be an inverted parabola, it could be any uh, profile. Uh, as a function of time, the evolution that I see uh, is just described by a scaling transformation. So I can say, you know, I can collapse any of these curves by carefully rescaling the coordinates in real space. Now, this is real space variable. Uh, so you just a one dimensional case, but we will see a higher dimensional one. And you, you know, you account as well for the normalization. And you know, everyone familiar with cold atom experiments knows that this is typically what is done in, in time of flight. Yeah, we have a, a, a system which is in a trap and we typically switch off the trap, release the cloud, the atomic cloud, it starts to expand. Now it's big enough so that we take a picture and then we, we just use typically uh, classical equations of motion to infer what was the initial state in the, in the trap. 
and, and this process really relies on the scale environments. So this is what I just described, you know, time of flight imaging uh, typically exploits scale invariants, but there are many other processes that, that do, you know, one is if you have a known the Thomas Fermi regime, and again, this is a system where in any spatial dimension, one, two, three, uh, it does have uh, scale invariance. I get a warning that uh, the connection is unstable. Uh, if you happen to have an ideal gas, a Bose or Fermi gas, also this in, in a harmonic trap, when you change the frequency of the trap, this is also a scale invariant. Uh, you may say, oh, well, this is either classical mean field or uh, non-interacting systems. No, you can consider, for instance, it's well known that a two-dimensional Bose gas, so uh, I have bosons in, on a plane, interacting with finite arbitrary strength contact interactions, uh, the S wave uh, pseudo potential is then uh, a delta function, a regularized delta function. So then it, it does exhibit the scale invariance. And in this context, is known as the Pitayevsky Ross uh, SO2,1 symmetry, as yes, Pitayevsky Ross symmetry. And it's very much used to, to study the uh, breathing modes of, of the cloud. Other examples include the Tonks Girardot gas, so hardcore bosons in one dimension where the contact interactions is so strong that you know they effectively satisfy a Pauli exclusion principle, so they behave like fermions. So this is a, a regime which has been proven in many experiments to date. And uh, you know, yet another one uh, is the three-dimensional unitary Fermi gas, so we have a spin, a spin one half particles, and we have a, a, a balanced mixture of a spin up and spin down, and we make the interactions between spin up and spin down divergent. So this is what is called the unitary limit of a, a Fermi gas. So a unitary Fermi gas has, as a result of the strong interactions, emergent scale invariance, which will be absent if interactions are finite. So you see sometimes strongly coupled, strongly interacting systems uh, exhibit emergent symmetries, such as scale invariance. So this is just a, a slide to motivate that the, there is a wide class of systems on which we will be able to probe the speed limits by the proposal and putting forward. Now, uh, here's uh, a, a, a bit of, you know, how do we describe uh, scale invariance mathematically? Well, we assume that we have a system which is isolated, so it's described by a Hamiltonian, and uh, it, there's some trap in the system. So we typically think of a quantum fluid, so many particles in a harmonic trap, or some frequency omega. And let's just label by psi zero a given uh, energy eigenstate at time zero with some energy eigenvalue. And what we are going to be concerned is with modulations of the uh, trapping frequency, modulations of the uh, confinement. Well, scale invariance is, uh, doesn't mean that correlations are boring. You know, before I just saw what happens in the density profile, but you know, the evolution of the state is not as simple. You know, it has. It is true that the time-dependent state you can write it always as a function of the initial state at time zero by rescaling the coordinates. Yes, so every coordinate you rescale it by a factor b which is essentially telling you uh, uh, by how much the radius of the cloud is changing yeah, as a function of time. So B is going to play a crucial uh, role. It is an experimentally measurable quantity, and it determines the expansion factor or compression factor you know, given scaling invariant evolution. Apart from just the scaling with the proper normalization for n particles in spatial dimension D, uh, the state picks up a dynamical phase, which plays little role in our proposal, and uh, a phase modulation uh, where excitations build up depending on the, on the speed at which the, the, the cloud is expanding. So you see, if we know B, we essentially know how the state is changing as a function of time, even if we don't have direct access to the explicit form of Psi. Yeah? And the equation of motion that governs uh, the scaling factor B as a function of the frequency change of the trap is a simple ordinary differential equation, uh, which is nonlinear in the sense that it depends on B cube, uh, but it's well known and there are even tricks to, to solve it. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's kind of a uh, nice equation. Good. Uh, if I want to say something about the fidelity, I need to uh, exploit scaling variance further. 
this just tells me what kind of evolution I have, but I do need to specify what kind of states I have. Yeah? So I'm going to focus on uh, many particle systems of uh, essentially indistinguishable particles, all with equal mass. Uh, will, they will have some kinetic energy, and there's going to be pairwise interactions. It could be higher volume interactions, it doesn't matter. Uh, and I, I just start considering uh, free energy, uh, so eigenstates, meaning in the absence, uh, I want to say, in the absence of a trap. So, you know, these are kind of uh, particles scattering in, in real space. It could be one, two, three dimensions. And, you know, I will have some eigenstates and eigenvalues. Then uh, I'm going to explore the scaling property of these uh, eigenstates in the absence of the trap. Uh, whenever I'm able to, you know, this equation is satisfied, if I'm able to scale the particle coordinates and pull out this scaling factor as some power, uh, then I will be able to compute the fidelity. Yeah, so this is a crucial property of a scaling variance. What I'm saying is the untrapped states, the states in the absence of the trap, energy eigenstates, are also eigenstates of a scaling transformations. So this is kind of the eigenvalue, lambda nu, and that's why I can use nu as a quantum label uh, for, for the state, because it's actually a good quantum number. Now, it is a trick, kind of elementary 101 quantum mechanics, uh, to uh, the, the observation that you can relate these uh, eigenstates in the absence of the trap with eigenstates when you add a trapping potential to your system. And the way you do it, it's very simple. <laughs> you take the uh, eigenstate in free space, you multiply it by a Gaussian factor, and now you can check that this satisfies the uh, uh, Schrodinger equation of your initial Hamiltonian, kinetic energy plus interactions, but now with a trap. And the eigenstates, which before was epsilon nu, now becomes epsilon nu plus this term, which is really what, well, you know, kind of harmonic oscillator thing, but nu here plays the role of the scaling dimension of the eigenstates. Uh, Adolfo, uh, yes. we have a question from Dominic. Please, Dominic. Please. Yes, yeah, so I want to make sure I understand the general picture here. So the measurement of time of flight doesn't really, it doesn't act as a state tomography, right? So it doesn't tell you what the state is. But then exactly. you said, but then you yeah. said that it doesn't matter because you know what the evolution is. So you are able to tell whether some state is orthogonal or when some state is orthogonal after some time to the initial state even though we don't know those states. Yeah, well, I, it goes into this direction. I don't want to do state tomography in these systems because it's impossible. Yeah, these are, you know, n particle continuous variable high, uh, right. arbitrary spatial dimension. However, I will be able that I am able to extract the necessary information just by measuring the, the expansion factor of the cloud. Wow, this looks crazy because I am just getting very little information. But on top of that, I am putting very strong symmetries Scale invariance is a very strong symmetry on the structure of the eigenstates, as well as on the dynamics. And as a result, I will be able to, to get away. Yeah. So, so you will be able, able to compute the fidelity? Exactly. Or... So this was the, the next slide. So, you know, if I now I'm concerned with, uh, yes, uh, what happens, to, you know, I, I start in some trapper state, I modulate it as a function of time. Now I can show by explicit computation using exclusively only this uh, scaling symmetry, essentially for this kind of eigenstates for, and using as well the previous uh, evolution law. So this kind of uh, dynamics, I can show that the fidelity is just given by a funny combination of the scale factor and its rate of change. So, so the initial state drops out of this. The, the initial state is one of these scaling variant eigenstates. I modulate the trapping frequency and because the dynamics is a scale invariance, I can rewrite the fidelity in just, as a function of the scaling factor. The scaling factor and something else, uh, there's a quantity here which I call sigma squared, and this has a beautiful interpretation. You can think of it as either the uh, variance of the center of mass, if you wish, uh, in the initial state at time zero in some units, which are those of kind of uh, uh, harmonic oscillator units, so, so uh, square root of h bar over m omega zero is what I call x naught. Or if you wish, you can think of it as a, a, the initial energy I can value in some, again, harmonic oscillator units. So uh, the initial so state is, comes in only in this factor. So, so, so ex exactly, uh, very good point, okay, thanks. Good. 
So, so the well, I mean, this all, as well the structure, yes, it's as well the structure. But all the, um, all the, so some very important features of the state, which are you know what, what's the spatial dimension, what's the particle number, what's the scaling dimension of the state, only come through through this power, and this power actually encodes orthogonality principle, yes, because you know just think of many body systems. You know what we understand. Uh, Philip Anderson taught us is that if you have a many body system, you perturb it a bit then it's going to become orthogonal to itself very quickly. Yeah. And there are small perturbations. That's orthogonality catastrophe. Well, uh, this is something that should be obvious in this case. Our perturbation is changing the frequency a bit. So how, how, how sensitive or how different is the state with a given frequency from the state that has been evolved by a tiny little bit? So here, the, there's an expression. And this happens to be kind of the same one you will get for a, a, a isotropic tiny dependent harmonic oscillator. And it turns out that all the many particle structure is built on top just by exponentiating this to this power. Of course, if this power is very large, this fidelity goes to zero very quickly. So this is in the sense in which this thing calls orthogonality catastrophe. So, okay, with these caveats and limitations and acknowledging that this is not universal and we are restricted to a given class of dynamics, we have succeeded in computing perhaps the most difficult part, which was the fidelity. Now, for to measure speed limits, we also need a notion of the speed of evolution. And remember that uh, by Mandel's time, time, this is upper bounded by the energy fluctuations. So there's another uh, result. Uh, and for, oh, well, I guess, I guess you know, this, this goes for people like uh, Dominic or actually also like the experimentalists. Yeah? So I was just making this cartoon, you know, imagine you want to, you know, you are thinking of doing this in the lab. So how about making a state tomography of a many particle systems with continuous variables in dimension D. Of course, you don't want to do it, so you will be very happy if you can just get along, uh, get away with measuring the uh, radius of the cloud. So I guess this is the, the power of this proposal is in this huge simplification. Yeah. Um, well, so, so the other ingredient of speed of, uh, of, of speed limits is the notion of up, an upper bound to the speed of evolution. And we saw that this is provided by energy fluctuations in the, in the time dependent state. Well, it turns out that again for scaling variant systems, this is already something we saw in a, in a, in a, in a different work with Matthew Bo. Uh, the energy fluctuations can be for all these family of systems I have discussed, the scaling variant and many body and so on, can be uh, just uh, encoded in this uh, uh, equation. I, again, you see sigma square here appearing, this quantity which tells you essentially all the many body features of the system. This is yeah, the frequency of the trap. And Q star is something very well known in quantum thermodynamics. We know it's in the works from Kusimi. Uh, essentially, it's the ratio between the non, mean non adiabatic energy and the mean adiabatic energy. Uh, sometimes called quantum friction. This is something that appears every time you do kind of harmonic quantum auto cycles and Carnot cycles and so on. Yeah. Uh, this quantity uh, Q star is just again a different combination as it was the, fide the fidelity. So this is a given uh, a different combination of the scaling factor and its rate of change. And of course, it depends on the on the on the frequency of the trap. But this is th they are both related. Remember that the equation for B, the Hertzmakov equation, depends on omega t. So you know, this is experimentally measurable. It's a quantity that uh, is typically always larger than one unless you are strictly adiabatic. And you know there was just this experiment uh, in a collaboration with a group of Hai Bingbu at East uh, China Normal University, where they did use uh, you know uh, unitary Fermi gas. Yeah? So this is a three-dimensional, strongly interacting, many-particle continuous variable uh, system, uh, where thanks to this uh, divergent unitary limit, the divergent S-wave interactions, we have a scaling variance. And you know this is just uh, actually measure measurement data. For two expansions, one in which is non-adiabatic and you know uh, friction can can so grow up, and the other one is for a quantum control protocol where you create lots of excitations around the process, but at the end uh, you are guaranteed to uh, match the adiabatic uh, energy in finite time. So this is a kind of one of these shortcuts to adiabaticity. Uh, but at any rate, you see that this Q star is experimentally measurable, and therefore so is the energy fluctuations for this system. So now we have the two ingredients: we have the uh, variance, uh, I mean the fidelity, and the energy fluctuations. So we, we are in, then in, we, we can go ahead, oh, sorry, and, and try to probe this kind of uh, speed limit, where you know uh, we remember that the uh, distance traveled by a quantum state, which was given in terms of the fidelity is upper bounded by the uh, integral of the energy dispersion. So this is something we can test. 
we could do many other tests. We, you know, we could look at the rate of change of the uh, Buddhist angle explicitly, and we also can extract it obviously. Um, so two applications I want to discuss. One is in the context of optimal control. So I'm going to compare uh, typical expansion uh, where you know we just take a trap and expand it in some uh, time scale tau by doing a linear ramp. And I want to alternatively use it uh, uh, for one of these shortcuts to adiabaticity. So I'm going. I have to tell you a bit how how these shortcuts work for scale invariant dynamics. Yes. So remember that under scale invariant dynamics, the evolution of the state is uh, like this. And there are a main source of excitations comes from this phase factor. You can make this phase factor vanish, maybe by saying B dot equal to zero, then you have the chance that the time dependent state matches at some point a stationary state of some other Hamiltonian. So this is what the shortcuts do. You know, we, we typically start with, uh, of course, we said uh, that the initial state is at equilibrium. So you know, we force b to be equal to one and b dot equal to zero at time zero. So we have a stationary state. Then we want to match reach in finite time the stationary state of a different Hamiltonian. We do we want to do a fast expansion such that the, the final state is a, a, a again an energy eigenstate or a stationary state, a non equilibrium state, a equi equilibrium state. Of the final Hamiltonian. So at the end of the expansion, we demand that this uh, phase vanishes by setting B dot equal to zero. And we carefully choose the final uh, ex expansion factor equal to the one we will get in an adiabatic evolution. And we, this is not needed. We can put other boundary conditions at time zero if we want to guarantee uh, everything is smooth. Uh, how, you know, just to, to recall, you know, this, this factor where I pull it out from, where well, I just look at the Ermakov equation, I say, imagine what happens if I drive it slowly, so I can kill the uh, acceleration of the scaling factor, and then I can just solve for uh, the what will be the adiabatic scaling factor. And at the end of the process, I demand that I reach the same. So, you know, I'm kind of uh, targeting a equilibrium state. Now, I have lots of boundary conditions, so I can now just fix any ansatz I wish with these boundary conditions, I mean, low order ansatz as a function of time. And, you know, I can find an interpolating ansatz between the initial state and the target state. Uh, and, you know, this polynomial one yeah, is one of the very many that does the job. And once I do that, I can use the famous Hermakov equation to uh, uh, essentially come out with the experimental prescription of what kind of modulation of the trapping frequency will actually guide the dynamics through these interpolating ansatz for the scaling factor. So, you know, I, I, I say the initial state I, I, I have, I target a given final state. I found an interpolating, I, I found a, a, a evolution which does the job, and then I find the uh, experimental conditions to realize this trajectory in the laboratory by just prescribing the modulation of the trapping frequency. So, you know, yes, you know, the typical dri driving frequencies that appear by using this technique are very reasonable, are smooth. You know, here is in a, uh, so you are lowering the frequency of the trap, so you are making an expansion. So this will, uh, yes, it's just some, some modulation. It's not a linear ramp. Uh, it's, not, it's not a straight line as a function of time. Uh, it has some, some modulation. It becomes more difficult because uh, you need to invert the trap into an anti-trap. If you demand extremely fast processes, but there are shortcuts to adiabaticity which simply with a standard modulation, uh, which simply is nonlinear, do the job. It's much easier even to do shortcuts for compressions. So for compressions, you typically even you can go very fast and you don't get into crazy regimes. But you know, uh, importantly, uh, shortcuts to adiabaticity can be done with uh, reasonable modulations of the trapping frequency. So I just want to, uh, you know, I thought these are two interesting kind of expansions. Linear ramp is what many people do in the lab. And shortcuts to adiabaticity is something which is motivated by optimal control. And you may wonder what's the difference in the quantum speed limits. So I first want to show you know, what happens to the uh, scaling factor of the cloud. You see that if you make a non-adiabatic evolution, the scaling factor starts to rose for expansion, but it does not reach the, the equilibrium value for the final uh, configuration. So this is as a function of time in the total time of the process. Uh, you know, so uh, this for given duration tau. Uh, so, and this is an adiabatic evolution where the scaling factor lags behind the 
the equilibrium value of the final Hamiltonian. You see that a shortcut is able to uh, perfectly interpolate. It has been constructed in that way so that it interpolates between an initial state and a target state in finite time. Now you can look at the fidelity. So, okay, what I do is to plot the logarithm of the fidelity and I remove the uh, factor which captures orth orthogonality catastrophe. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yes, because it's in this representation is universal for any, any such factor. And uh, what you see again is the same. You know, well, of course, it's an expansion. The state is becoming orthogonal to itself. It will become much more orthogonal if this expansion is large, uh, but it decreases as a function of time. And uh, it, you know, because uh, it, it somehow, the, what is interesting is that in an adiabatic expansion, you know, the, the, the decay of the fidelity is, is smaller than if I use a shortcut where I'm guaranteed that I reach the target state. So, you know, so certainly orthogonality, further orthogonality is guaranteed. Now, I can compare now the two quantities. One is the upper bound to the distance traveled. So this is the biggest distance. And this is the distance actually traveled by the state. And, you know, so the, we, we know that Manders and Tan, uh, quantum speed limit always tell us that the distance travel is smaller than the, the, the maximum distance you could have sweep if you travel at the speed limit at all times. Yes? So here you see two, you know, so let's just focus first on, on the linear protocol. So this is the maximum distance travel. And this is the distance that the system actually travels as a function of the duration of the process. So over here, we are reaching the adiabatic limit. And you see that there is, a, uh, uh, you know, you are, and you are essentially never at the, uh, at the speed limit. You know, this distance never reaches this. And actually, as you make the process slower and slower, you don't satisfy the speed limits. You, are, you don't become tight in, the evolu in, in, in reaching Manders and time speed of evolution. There's always a, a, a difference, yes, a finite difference. The same thing happens for shortcuts to adiabaticity. It's actually different. You know, what you are guaranteed is the distance you actually travel is fixed because, you know, shortcuts promise you that you're stuck in a given state, you reach the final state, no matter the evolution time. They are constructed in this way, yeah? So that's why you see that the distance actually travel is, is uh, a, a constant. Yeah? Now, the distance you could have traveled, if you make use of all the energy resources, if you, if you travel at, at the speed limit uh, governed by energy fluctuations, it's much larger. In particular, for very fast expansions, it's way, way larger. And as you make the process more slowly, well, you, know, you recover the adiabatic results that you had got with other kinds of expansion, which didn't know anything about optimal control. So we can we can plot this difference, yes, uh, just yes, the excess of the distance, uh, sorry, the, defi the the efficiency of the distance travel with respect to, to the to the final one. And you see again that you know uh, in a in a way shortcuts to the electricity are very inefficient from the point of view of quantum speed limits at short times and then become better and better, but yes, as good as the adiabatic evolution. Uh, you may say that a sudden expansion, linear expansion appears to be here reaching the speed limit, you know, because the difference is tight. But this really corresponds to the sudden points where you have not let the system evolve. So this is kind of a um, not a relevant case for the evolution. Yes. So, so it, in, in a way, you know, no, none of the process is, is time optimal from the point of view that none of the process reaches speed limits. Good. So uh, how am I doing with time? Uh, okay, maybe I, I should rush a bit. I just want to mention that, you know, let's then go for a technique which has been stated to satisfy the quantum brachistochrome problem, so the, which is the time-optimal protocol. And this is counter diabetic driving. So it's a universal technique to engineer control protocols of isolated systems. If you have a system and you drive it slowly, you know that the adiabatic approximation describes the evolution. You may wonder where the adiabatic approximation to your system is actually the exact solution of a different Hamiltonian. H is different from H0. And here, this is the adiabatic approximation to H0. And this is always the case. You can always find this Hamiltonian, and it's your system Hamiltonian plus some control. Yeah? And this is what is called the counter diabatic control, which you can find explicitly if you know the item states of the system. There are other ways to find it, but you know, typically, this is the original construction. So this technique has been known for a while. It was developed by Stuart Rice and his postdoc, Mustafa Demirplak. Uh, they wrote beautiful papers in 2003, five and eight, and uh, then Michael Berry rediscovered it as I have presented it and gave it a different name. Transition is quantum driving that also comp compels the, the meaning 
Um, there have been a couple of experiments with sim simple systems like uh, qubit and a qtrit and a harmonic oscillator, uh, but you know, uh, has not been shown for many body systems. Uh, other than scale invariant systems. And it does have, uh, you know, this technique has been proposed to suppress quantum friction in quantum thermodynamics and, and prepare a run engines at maximum efficiency with high power. Yeah, so this works by Jan Bingon and, and John Good, Mauro Paternoster, and myself, uh, and so on. I mentioned that, you know, there, there was this experiment where this was, it was shown that you can suppress quantum friction and reach maximum efficiency in a, but this was not for a heat engine, this was just a single stroke, so essentially expansion or a compression, and it was on that it is possible to, to control friction. So this is what I presented before. Good. So this counter diabetic problem has been argued to solve the uh, quantum brachistochrome problem, which is the time optimal uh, protocol, which tells you what, you know, with fixed energy variance, which is really what Mandelstam time captures as upper bound to the speed of evolution. What's the, what's the protocol that drives me from a state to a, a final state in, 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 in a time optimal way, in minimum time? So such protocol should satisfy uh, Mandelstam time. Uh, so time, uh, you know, so this, this notion of quantum brachistochrome problem was introduced by Carlini and co-workers 2006. Uh, it has excited lots of research, motivated lots of research. And uh, again, so th there are some statements of how it is related to counter diabetic driving. So here I want to show by example, yes, in a one, one, two slides, that actually not even these protocols satisfy uh, Mandelstam time for driven systems. And, uh, you know, I, in the interest of time, let me just skip it. You can compute everything for this system and uh, you can show that uh, you know you can you have access to the energy fluctuations you have access to the Bure's angle and you can show uh, the excess you know the deficiency of reaching the speed limit as a function of the expansion factor so it turns out this is a highly controlled system where you, you uh, essentially everything depends on on the ratio between the final and initial frequency you see that the efficiency is never, you, you can show mathematically, it looks, it look, this looks like uh, it's approximately zero here. It is not, there's always a linear dependence governed by uh, essentially this term sigma. So if the process never reaches uh, the speed limit unless there is no process, unless the, the final frequency is equal to the initial one. So I just want to solve, you know, counter diabetic driving, which sounds like it should solve the quantum brachistochrome, brachistochrome problem, it does not. Yeah? For scaling variant processes, here is an explicit, explicit counter example. Yeah? Uh, so with this, I close. Yeah? This, this was something I wanted to say. So uh, I, I guess I motivated speed limits, how there are fundamental results in quantum dynamics that have many applications, yet no direct experimental measurement uh, to date. And one way of probing them is with ultra glasses as long as you stick to scale invariance, and then you can just use the standard techniques to measure the radius of the cloud, the expansion factor, and with that information, you can reconstruct everything you need, the energy fluctuations and the uh, fidelity between the initial and the final state. And as applications, we have seen the part of quantum control uh, and uh, how not even this counter diabetic driving uh, provides a time optimal uh, uh, control. Yeah? So it's very hard, I guess the recipe here, is very hard to engineer processes for driven Hamiltonians that saturate the speed limit. So it is known that if the system, if the Hamiltonian is time independent, you can find such, such protocols. Uh, but as long as the system is driven in finite time, yeah, I guess, I guess uh, there are no protocols known. Yeah, uh, that's at least what, what we conclude. All right, so that was all. Yeah, thank you all for your attention. So thanks a lot, uh, Adolfo, for this wonderful talk. Let's thank our speaker. Uh, yeah, the floor is open for questions. So, uh, if there are questions from the audience, you can either raise your hand or just unmute yourself and ask. Uh, let Let me ask one quick question. Uh, maybe Maybe it's a stupid one, but. Uh, when you're looking at fidelity and, uh, you know, these energy fluctuations, um, do these form a pair of uh, sort of commuting observables or uh, can, can I represent fidelity by, by some form of an operator as, as an observable? 
I guess in the in the case of of this talk, the operator will be the projector onto the initial many body state, and then you could think of uh, the fidelity as the mean value of the projector onto the initial many body state. This is a projector you are not going to be easily <laughs> uh, able to implement in the laboratory. Yes, because you, you essentially need right this. So, because what I'm thinking about is you need to measure the fidelity and the energy fluctuation simultaneously. So can you really do this? I mean... Uh... Oh, no, 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 yeah, you see. So, okay, so, so may, uh, maybe I was not clear there. Uh, the experiment will, will, will have a trapped quantum fluid and then do something with the trapping frequency. And then okay. look at the evolution just by taking pictures of the cloud, yeah? So you will... You, you will mm -hmm. Uh, take pictures at different times, and of course, at any time you collect the statistics so that you can, you know, get a nice picture. And from there, you extract the scaling factor. So you just extract essentially this, oh, uh, the B. this mm -hmm. uh, you know, quantity which tells you by how much the cloud has expanded from the initial time to the final time. And with that information, you are done because then you can just follow the mathematical recipe of reconstructing uh, energy fluctuations, reconstructing fidelity, and so on. I see. This is, so, I, so you're not me, directly aiming at measuring the fidelity and the energy fluctuations, but rather than no, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think, factors. but you know, directly doing it in, in these systems is not possible. Yeah, I, I actually yeah. some some people have kind of formalized this that you know for I continuous see. variable systems, you know, it's very you know it's just very hard. Or yeah, yeah, it's essentially impossible. The, the, this is very much in the spirit of the kind of experimental analysis that people do of uh, of in ultra collatons. Yes, you you know you you always. Uh, the typical probe, I mean, there are other ways of probing ultracolatoms, but one of them, you know, I guess, more, more most ubiquitous is just looking at the radius of the cloud. And then once you can tell something about the dynamics, like in time of flight, essentially it's just kinetic energy, free kinetic energy, then you use this theory to reconstruct other things, like the way you uh, make statements about the momentum distribution mm -hmm. of the initial state. You, you don't do it by measuring it directly, you could by back diffraction or something like this, but uh, you just let the cloud expand, take the picture of the radius of the cloud, and then use some analysis, some kind of analysis to say, oh, I know I had a state with this momentum distribution or this kinetic energy or this temperature. So it's, it really falls into the standard philosophy of experimental probes of ultra core gases, where pretty much by using a routine measurement, which is uh, measurements of the radius of the cloud, you can infer other quantities, uh, not just the standard ones, kinetic energy and temperature, but also things like fidelities and energy fluctuation. I see. Um, thanks a lot for that. Let's see if there are some questions from the audience. Uh, in, in mean, uh, by the way, all this many body stuff that come, many body interactions, they all come into your sigma, right? Yes. Uh, yeah. So uh, I was just curious to know whether uh, there can be some connections made between this sigma and OTOCs or which people used to study these so many body interactions typically nowadays. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, great. I mean, we, I, I, I have, I, you see, if you have, I, I have thought a, about, a bit about it, uh, you know, how to, uh, and, you know, there, there's some OTOC you can uh, maybe derive exploiting a scale invariance. I think, you know, if you just look at, at yeah, at the ones I look at, uh, this sigma square was not present. I guess the setting was too simple. You see, like, if you just think of the definition of, you know, these are quantum fluids. I guess you could look at different things like density, density correlators or position momentum uh, kind of uh, commutators. Yes? If you look at the position momentum commutators under this kind of dynamics, then you do not learn anything beyond what you will learn in the single particle case. So even this sigma mm -hmm. square is absent. Um, mm -hmm. um, I hope I'm, I, I mean, I, I, I haven't worked it out thoroughly. I just uh, work, uh, look at a bit, uh, have some discussions with Uwe Fischer there at Seoul and mm -hmm. uh, during my last visit. Um, uh, I, this is what we thought of and okay, so um, yeah, I mean, it, may be, it may depend on the observables, on the autox you, you define. Okay. So, seems like the audience does not have any raised hands. So, 
Uh, with that, let us all thank our speaker once again for this wonderful talk. Well, thank you very much. And, uh, we will have a short five minute break and come back. There will be a small discussion session for people who are interested in uh, knowing further details about this work and probably many other works that Atolfo is involved with. So if you're interested, please come back after five minutes and we will continue. I'll keep this session open. Thank you. So uh, we just go and grab a coffee. I'll grab a coffee and I'll come back. Perfect. I'll do the same. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks. I'll leave it open.